humanity faces a lot of problems. Smaller problems, such as a dead battery on your telephone, but also bigger problems, so-called wicked problems. And Tilburg University offers the GMSI program, Global Management of Social Issues. And Global Management of Social Issues deals with wicked problems. And today we're going to talk about migration. Why do people leave everything behind to go somewhere else and make a better life? And we're going to talk about migration with Dr. Jörg Graap. He's from Germany and he's the Associate Professor of the Department of Organizational Studies, but he is also the Educational Director of the GMSI program. And his main focuses are governance and the effectiveness of networks. Second, we have a second year student, Panna Kerti. She is born in Hungary, but currently studying here at Tilburg. She is a chairwoman of the International Student Advisory Platform and she is focused on migration and in the future wants to work with minor unaccompanied refugees. And last but not least, we have a guy from Poland, Adam Jetschik, a second year student of the GMSI program as well. He's the president of MUN Tilburg, the model United Nations here in Tilburg. And he's migrated a lot. You've lived in Kuwait, in Egypt. So you're a migrant yourself. Adam, what was the first thing that you struck as an immigrant here at Tilburg? Um, I think the openness of the society. Uh, and I think that was something, something that I, I value really greatly. And I think the community feeling and the, the, the way people interact with one another is something the Netherlands and Tilburg can be very proud of. So we can be proud of ourselves. We're an Absolutely. open society. Nice. Absolutely. Panna, uh, you came from uh, Hungary, but why do you want to work with the, the unaccompanied minor refugees? Why that specific group? Uh, my parents' uh, profession is related to uh, work with, working with children as well. And I'm also uh, specifically interested in working with those who are the most vulnerable in society. And those are those children, you know, who, who are in such a vulnerable situation that they are with, without parents. And at the same time, you know, they, they don't really have resources. And it's really difficult for them to reach out to the right authorities. Make the world a better place for, the, <laughs> for these children. And of course, uh, Dr. Jörg Raab, um, well, a wicked problem, if, if you can give a 20-second lecture of wicked problems, what is a wicked problem? Well, a wicked problem is a very complex organizational or policy problem, like, for example, migration, poverty, uh, climate change. And um, they are characterized by, let's say, three dimensions. One, that a lot of problem dimensions are interrelated, huh? and that creates complexity. Then there's usually uncertainty about the knowledge base. Uh, why do we have this problem? And about certain outcomes, huh, if we do something. Uh, and then very often there is what we call value divergence. So different parties that are um, connected to the problem, they have different values and therefore perceive the problem uh, quite differently. And can they be solved, the wicked problems? Is there a solution for wicked problems? Well, there is. Uh, it's not like a problem is wicked or not. Huh? There are different uh, levels. Huh? But if you uh, say, for example, poverty huh? or migration, um, that cannot be solved as if huh, we take certain policy measures and then the problems are just gone. But usually we say we can do better or worse in coping with them. Huh? So limit the negative consequences. The problem will be there, but we can cope with them better exactly. in the future. And uh, we're going to talk about migration. And of course, you all are immigrants because you came from a different country to the Netherlands. Um, Panel, why is migration a wicked problem? Well, I would say it has a lot of different aspects why it is so wicked. Uh, if you think about, you know, not only the economic aspects of integration, but also we can think about, you know, the cultural ones. And these are very different things and, and it's very, it requires a lot of effort from the immigrant to be able to, um, you know, integrate within the society. But it also requires a lot of efforts from the society to integrate that uh, newcomer to the, to the society. So I think this is a really interesting issue because I do believe that it's very two-sided and in the and at the same time you know it's it's something that's very unique because it's very culturally enriching as well. So I think it, it also has its positive and negative sides and it's really interesting to go in depth in that and do research in, yeah. in this field. You can see with the policy discourse in different countries right now what integration is yeah. uh, is already quite contested. Uh, some people basically say well you have to do the language, you have to uh, uh, accept the culture, uh, while other people say, well, you know, as long as you follow the law, uh, then you're fine. Yeah, I think with migration, the biggest problem uh, is prob the, the definition problem. Uh, there's quite a lot of disagreement as to what the problem with migration actually is or who a migrant or a refugee is. Exactly. And that is why I think policymakers are struggling 
uh, with coming with any sort of solution because some believe that um, you're only a refugee in the first country of th that you arrive in. Others believe that if you move on, you become an economic migrant and so on and so forth. So that in itself is a problem already. And how do you guys discuss the definition of migration in class? Or in your lectures, what? Well, I think it's very, very important to say that within global management of social issues, it's really important that we have a really good theoretical background, meaning that um, you know defining these concepts is what we start with in the first place. So seeing wh wh what a migrant is, who a migrant is, and what a refugee is, and seeing the difficulties is not only connected to one field of social sciences, but it's also connected to international law. It's also connected to economics. Looking into these different aspects is very important, and seeing that, for example, you know refugees they come from a place where you know they are literally threatened you know that they are they are in in very risk of their lives and being a migrant being an economic migrant is more about looking for better opportunities and living with those opportunities and trying to you know reach them by migrating to a different country or a different area if you are talking about you know within country migration and you see that um, in in Europe for instance we mostly focus in the media uh, on the negative sides of uh, yeah. migration because you said there were a lot of a lot of positive sides as well. Um, how, how is that not helping the problem, the the focusing on the negative side of migration? I think it could be an issue, like it could be a social issue in the sense that sometimes people are afraid to get to know new cultures. So um, obviously, it requires a really open society to be able to welcome migrants and and you know um, find those aspects of migration um, you know enriching that they are you know and seeing that a diverse community and a diverse diverse workforce, for example, at a work workplace can really contribute to um, tackling issues and and solving issues in different ways. And seeing those different perspe perceptions can be really enriching, in my opinion. And I think if a society is being able to see that, then they are going to able to cope with the integration issues as well. So we well, should say we should start with changing the society which is there, changing Dutch, uh, the I Dutch views is, on mi migration. I think this is more of an internal change. So you cannot really change society, but I do believe that um, by introducing society to people who are, you know, economic migrants or refugees as well, which is also an issue, um, you know, by getting to know them and, and, and uh, um, organizing mentor programs or volunteer programs where the uh, members of the society can, can work with the newcomers, um, then they can really see those, those great aspects of, of uh, you know, getting to know new people from different cultures. Which is difficult, Adam. I don't think you can necessarily, or you don't necessarily have to change society in itself. I think what is important to take a look at is the narrative that is being created by politicians, policymakers, but also individuals within society and community themselves. Uh, because if this, if, if this negative narrative is there, if we label uh, migrants or refugees as evil, as bad, yeah. uh, as foreign, then stereotypes are created. If negative stereotypes are created, um, then refugees and migrants alike will indeed be seen in a negative light by the majority of people. And I think what is important to realize for society, for communities, for the host community, uh, is that these people are just as normal and, and very similar to us. The only difference is that they're a bit less fortunate. Uh, they happen to live in a country, if we take Syria as, as an example, where there's a civil war going on, or in poor uh, regions and areas of the world. And um, we, being in a more fortunate position, we should do everything in our power to help them. But you say unfortunate because, um, I mean, you, I, I don't, do not know your background, but it seems you're not poor, you didn't come from a war zone, so there are also the not unfortunate people, but just normal migrants, but still that is a problem. I think it's about the narrative, as Adam said. So, for example, within the program, we learned about intergroup uh, stress theory, which is basically a theory um, where, you know, by creating narrative, you know, social leaders, politicians, you know, someone in your community who is more influential, um, if they create a narrative, then uh, the society can experience, um, you know, symbolic threat. So that's not necessarily real threat, it's, it can be symbolic, you know, like, for example, the, the narrative that they had in Eastern Europe uh, during the refugee crisis, oh, you know, refugees are going to take your jobs, they are going to, you know, I don't know, like, you know, s decrease social security. But those I are mostly political uh, statements. Yeah, exactly. They are going to take your job, the, the right-wing politicians often say that. Um, but how can you guys, with your studies and with your background, change that in order to make, well, maybe a solution for this problem? 
I think uh, it's about you guys giving do? exact data and very specific facts. I think by research we can really uh, get a good overview of what's exactly happening and not just, you know, and politicians then can, they can maybe see those numbers and then they maybe their, it can affect their policies, obviously. Mm -hmm. So by actually having facts, you know, like looking into those facts and, and creating research yeah. and, and doing research in that, that can be really influential, I think. In uh, you, you you're, you're a researcher yourself. Um, uh, do you provide your data to the politicians involved? Well, in my field of expertise, yes, we do. Um, uh, but I wanted to say, you know, uh, we, we do not deny in, in the course, for example, on migration that there are problems. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, is, that is very important. Uh, and uh, I think, especially right now, the European countries can do much better uh, yeah. than they do right now in, in what, what I said earlier, coping uh, with these uh, issues and avoid uh, negative repercussions for people that migrate, but also for um, the host uh, societies. And I see you guys nodding. Yes, you totally agree with uh, what's going on right now. Very they much. can do better. Yeah, very much. I very much What's the first that thing that they should change? What should they do? Well, I think coming back to what we were talking about, I think the first thing, uh, well, there are two things, actually. First is the definition and then uh, getting rid of these negative stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Because I think that is the first, if the community, if the society, if normal individuals in the host country see that the majority of these refugees are normal people who are just uh, looking for a better life, looking to flee away from war and persecution, uh, if people see that, then uh, they will be more open to help. Politicians can't do it on their own. They do need the support of community and local communities, local society. And in order for that support to be there, um, that narrative has to change. And I think that's a key starting point. A key starting point. Do you agree, Pana, or do you say, no, no, we shouldn't <laughs> talk about the narrative. We should go completely different uh, way. I do agree with Adam to some extent. I do believe that it is very much dependent on local communities. Because if you look at, for example, the integration uh, system of the Netherlands with refugees, we can see how um, you know refugees are integrated in society in such a way that they are distributed across the country. Now, for example, in Hungary, there are three refugee centers where you know all those refugees who came during the European refugee crisis in 2015, they were situated in three of those refugee camps. Here in the Netherlands, once and the integration starts- And there are big starts, cities, right? Exactly, not even big cities. It's more like small cities with a big refugee camp, you know? And maybe the population can be, you know, afraid. And also, you know, it's also about the narrative. But if local communities, also look into, okay, you know, we have this many refugees, we need to look into which societies, which local communities they could be fit in, I think that could be a really good uh, facilitator for integration. Okay, and you're, because in, in, in the program, of course, you focus on wicked problems, but because it's such a broad and diverse uh, problem, where, where do you guys start? Do you start with a solution or do you start with just small steps, which a small step for, for a human, but a giant leap for mankind? Well, as in, in all sort of uh, uh, scientific inquiry, we start with a good analysis of the, of the reasons uh, and the problems. Uh, and in the course, for example, we talk about uh, uh, different uh, uh, reasons to migrate. Uh, there are pull factors, uh, uh, but there are also push factors. Uh, and you can see that at the moment. And they are very diverse and sometimes uh, uh, they are interrelated and that makes it uh, complex. But uh, uh, first, uh, students have to learn uh, different theories about uh, why people migrate. And uh, migration has been of all times and will be of all times. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's quite important to understand uh, the different perspective and the different reasons before we move on to, okay, what can we then uh, do about it? And wh what can we do about it as, as, as from a scientific perspective? Can we, how can we cope with mi the migration problem in Europe, for instance? Well, I think there's, uh, the migration problem doesn't exist. I think that's where we have to start huh? uh, and say, okay, what, what are the different, uh, why are the different uh, groups and different people uh, uh, want to uh, come to Europe? Mm -hmm. uh, you have, of course, the civil war in Syria, but that's different uh, from sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where people uh, sometimes also flee because of, uh, uh, of military conflicts, uh, but also because uh, they seek a better life. Uh, and therefore, uh, if, if, if it's uh, improving the economic conditions uh, and uh, societal conditions in these countries, 
uh, Europe has to do more uh, to support these, uh, to support yeah. and develop these countries. Also, for example, with uh, better uh, trade deals, for example, uh, yeah. that uh, so far have been very often in, in favor of, uh, of the Europeans. Well, yeah, we want to keep the wealth in, in Europe, as people say. Um, just we, how, do you, how do you work with the solution? Is there a solution for such a broad problem? Um, well, I think that's one of the characteristics of a wicked problem, that there isn't sort of one quick solution to it. Um, there, and even if there would be a solution or attempt at it, it's a one-shot operation, meaning that there's just one attempt at it and you can't go back and improve it. Um, and I think when it comes to migration, uh, we have to, as has been said before, we have to learn to cope with it rather than um, by all means, at all means, try to solve it uh, within one day because that's just not going to happen. So we should look for solutions in the sense that, um, or, or ways rather in which we can cope with this large influx of migrants and then in the long term look for sustainable answers to the problem. And I think primarily, um, and this adds to the complexity of course, is to look at the root cause of migration. So that's something that has been uh, really discussed lately. Pana, your opinion on this? Uh, I think um, integration has different levels, right? So if you think about that, like, you know, if a migrant or a refugee arrives to a country, after, you know, getting their refugee status or, like, you know, starting their life here, there is different levels they can achieve, you know, finding employment, also, um, you know, learning the language, um, you know, maybe, you know, starting families here. Um, there are different levels of... of um, of um, migration and, and integration in general. And I do think that uh, the most important part of that is cultural uh, integration. And we need to look into short-term and long-term procedures uh, within this. And, and, and you know, we need to look into those solutions because looking at one of those is not going to lead to the required results. One important thing I think we have to mention is because we're, we're hearing quite a lot of solutions being, uh, being talked about here. Uh, we also have to remember that we cannot do 20 things at once. Yeah. Because if we start trying to solve integration, trying to solve poverty, trying to solve sort of the potential terrorist threat that, that is being talked about, um, then we won't, we won't, we won't uh, r resolve anything. Yeah. So I think what is important when it comes to talking about potential solutions or coping strategies is pick one focus point as a starting point uh, and then move on from there and not do Exactly. 20 things at once. And how does that work in a lecture? Because you are second year students, mm -hmm. um, you have the course, you have had the course Wicked Problems 101 for instance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wh where do you guys start? You get the topic, okay this is migration, then what? What's the next step? But as as uh, Dr. Rob mentioned it before, we l first look into the root causes, mm -hmm. and then uh, we also look at the theoretical framework that could be applied to uh, the social phenomena. Mm -hmm. After this, you always look into um, you know how this could be solved, different based on different literature. So this is very much theoretical. But at the same time, we also get a lot of uh, group assignments and individual assignments that we can you know, take home and then write them at home and work on them in groups. So this way we can kind of implement our own ideas within these papers. So that's a really practical way of applying our knowledge that we learned in the lecture. So I think this theoretical and practical basis really gives a good balance to the program. For example, in the, in the course uh, Wicked Problems 202, which is on migration, uh, we ended with a policy brief, uh, which is uh, not an academic paper, but basically a summary uh, for an imaginary EU commissioner that has to enter a meeting uh, and needs to be briefed on a certain topic. Uh, uh, very uh, concise, short, uh, and students had to uh, write that within uh, uh, 10 days and then present it. And maybe you can talk a little bit what, yeah. what topic yeah, you what, what, what was your policy for we, the UN commissioner? Um, well, we first of all, let me just give you a bit of background as to what the, t the topic that we chose to focus on was. And we, Pan and I and another uh, colleague of ours, we decided to focus on the issue of integration. Uh, and we chose Germany as a focus country. And the reason for that is uh, because what we can see with this high influx of Syrian refugees uh, is that they have a focus country that they want to go to. And that country uh, is Germany. Uh, Currently, there are over 5 million refugees spread around um, uh, countries worldwide. Germany is the fourth, uh, for in absolute terms, fourth country in terms of amounts of, of Syrian refugees. 
Um, so we focus on integration, and we ad we identified three key issues: uh, segregated housing, education, uh, and uh, obviously the the cultural differences. And Pana. Uh, Perhaps you can talk a bit about the recommendations. Recommendations, yeah. So um, the co as, as the conclusion of the policy brief, after looking at the issue, uh, reflecting on that, we came up with recommendations. And these recommendations are based on literature from UNHCR, also from uh, other refugee agencies who, who work with these refugees, and they think that these are policies that should be implemented in order to enable integration. So um, we looked at these three factors. So for example, we looked at like you know if refugees would have lower limits of being able to get social housing, that would really um, you know help them with, with starting a new life and really have that good basis of having a house you know um, also we looked into education where sometimes uh, it is a tendency that sometimes uh, the host national uh, children uh, bully for example those who who come to their school even though those um, kids already speak the language for example that can be a big issue and and uh, you know giving cultural awareness trainings in that can really help the kids to see how culturally enriching it is that they are from different cultures um, also, like you know, looking into education in general, we really need to be distinctive between the education of children and the education of adults. So basically, we looked into all of these um, issues and we tried to recommend uh, using our own recommendations and using some literature. And um, and yeah, honestly, I think it turned out quite good. It was a very interesting. It well, was a very we can interesting ask because we've assignment. got the teacher at the table. Yeah. Well, what was the grade? Well, moment about moment you won't tell <laughs> any grades. <laughs> okay. Moment of truth. Moment yeah. of truth. Well, is, but is, they have a good chance to passing the course. I can tell <laughs> <you>. <laughs> well, you. that's uh, already settled then. Yeah. Is there is there one uh, one question that your students would ask your teacher in in, in a lecture, just as, as an example? Is there a question that you would like to ask? Dr. Jörg Graap, considering migration, of course. I would personally ask, because I'm really interested in the social aspect of, of, and the cultural aspect of integration, like what do you think is the best facilitator of, of uh, cultural integration in general, looking at all countries? What do you mean with facilitator? I mean, um, like, do you think it's, it's um, learning the language? Do you think it's like being able to enter the labor market? What do you think is the best? Um, way to kind of be more part of society. Well, I, I think uh, if you look at the, uh, the discussions and uh, the experiences that uh, especially also European countries have uh, made in the last years, I think language is key. Yeah. Uh, and I think this is something that uh, also uh, the Netherlands uh, have now changed the policy on, uh, also Germany. In the beginning, uh, the countries didn't really look too much into um, maybe even forcing people to learn the language. Uh, and that is a big barrier. Uh, because without speaking the language, uh, you also it's very hard to enter the labor market, yeah. and then people very often have to, if they can enter the labor market, uh, work way below their uh, qualification levels, and yeah. and the countries also lose human capital, uh, quite frankly. So I think it's you know from both sides, it's uh, it's uh, uh, I think they have interest in in uh, learning the languages. Um, and I'll, uh, I, I think there is also something European countries can still improve because if you look at the Netherlands, for example, there's still discussion about how to offer these language courses, when, uh, how much pressure is behind it, who is actually giving them, what's the qualification yeah. of the uh, of the teaching personnel. Uh, and uh, uh, but I think it's worth the investment there because uh, it will reduce a lot of costs later. And Thank the human you. capital, yeah. which is in the refugees or in the migrants, is, yeah. is we can benefit from it exactly. as well. Yeah. So language is key. Adam, have you um, got a question? Yes, actually. Um, recently, the European Union and Turkey obviously struck a deal to uh, um, where Turkey would host uh, a large amount of refugees. And I just wanted to ask, from an academic or scientific perspective, do you think that's a sustainable solution? And do you think more such um, deals um, are necessary or should we look elsewhere? Uh, that's a very dif difficult question also because it's well, also... You're the expert on wicked yeah, problems. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. There but, you go. But there you can... I think it's a very good example of why migration is a wicked problem. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's, a be uh, it's a, especially also with Turkey and with Libya at the mm -hmm. moment, it's an enormous dilemma. Uh, um, uh, for all sorts of reasons, huh? the, the situation in these countries uh, and how refugees are treated there. But I think in terms of getting control of the situation again, I think it was unavoidable mm -hmm. uh, because, um, I mean, even if you would like uh, from a moral standpoint to welcome everybody here in Europe, 
uh, um, if societies are overburdened uh, with sort of um, uh, welcoming and then really hosting these people, uh, it's counterproductive. So I, I do think the, the, the nation states have to, or they, they did have to uh, gain control again uh, over their borders. Uh, uh, and I think the Turkey deal with other matter, measures achieved that. Now, should we stay there? No. I mm -hmm. think now the, 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 the question is, okay, we have stabilized the situation, so how can we alleviate the problems uh, in sort of the periphery of Europe? Uh, and how can we set up a system uh, that we can sort of organize a controlled uh, uh, influx of people from different groups uh, into Europe? So at that point, would it, would it be fair to, uh, at that particular moment when it was um, signed, that deal, what, is it fair to call the necessary evil? Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean that that sort of uh, the wicked problems. There are no sort of uh, mm -hmm. uh, best solutions. Yeah. Huh? There are also only just second coping solutions. Yeah, they're coping oh. so they're second yeah. best yeah. solutions. Huh? Yeah. And yeah. Pana, is this the way it works in a lecture? Uh, yeah, we can always ask questions. So I think that's very nice that um, you know we can really interact with the teachers, and they are also really open to us. You know, to come in there. Um, you know, free hours. We can always make appointments if we have any questions. So I do think that that's a really you know interactive way of learning. Okay. And of course, you get the opportunity to ask one question to the students. So so, well, let's see if their grade is as good as the policy that they just uh, invented. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the question I would ask is, I mean, you're you're, I mean, if the predictions are correct, uh, uh, population growth in Africa will be enormous mm -hmm. uh, in the next yeah. 30 years. Um, so your generation will be confronted with that uh, very likely. So what should we do about it? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very difficult question. That's a question. very good question. Um, I do think that there is going to be several waves of migration in the future, um, you know, like this one now and then, and then, you know, like the one after the Second World War. But um, I do think it is really difficult to say what's the, what's the best solution for that. But maybe if we, if we re reflect on what we learned in the course, um, I, would, I would personally say, because I'm very much like, you know, um, focused on social integration, is that by um, maybe you know, helping those people there to, um, to those communities there to, you know, be, um, you know, to, to engage in entrepreneurship and, and, and then start their own businesses, and maybe that way integrate in not necessarily only European societies, but only all over the world, um, I think that maybe could be a good uh, facilitator of, um, you know, equalized uh, population density. I think because, as you say, we, we already know that we will experience this uh, potential huge um, population growth in the future, and we already have the statistics and we can predict, uh, predict it, we can do something right now. So first thing is not to wait 10, 15 years, but act right now. And I think we should do everything in our power to limit the push factors for migration. So do everything in our power um, to ensure that those people um, will want to stay in their home countries, in Africa or wherever it may be, um, and that they will want to develop their countries from their country, if I can put it that way. Now, whether that is in, in economic aid, whether that is um, whether that involves yeah. going there and you know constructing schools, hospitals, yeah. or what have you, th that's open for discussion. But I think what is important to realize is that we shouldn't wait. If we know that something's going to happen, we should act. I do agree uh, with Adam, Adam on that. That uh, you know, planning ahead is really important, and you know, not only you know, I think economic growth can be a good answer to population growth in the sense that you know, mm. enabling those communities to be <coughs> self-sustainable is, is very important. Did they pass? Yeah, I would say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of course, the future is unpredictable, and we we can never see where we end up. But we can ask you, where do you guys want to end up? What's what's what are you going to do when you graduated? Very good question. I would personally love to work in um, in um, humanitarian response team. I personally find it really interesting. That's one of my because I, I find it a very dynamic environment and something I love working with people. So I do find that very important. But on the other hand, I would very much like to work in a more um, policy making role of, of helping children. So and United so United Nations uh, somewhere. Uh, maybe an international UNICEF. organization. Yeah, we will see how it goes. But I'm, I'm interested in these two fields and I'm still kind of doubting which way I would like well, to go. Well, you still got a couple of years to go. Adam, exactly. what are you going to do? It's 
It probably is the most difficult question of this entire discussion, if I can be completely okay, then honest. Okay, then we'll focus on that discussion <laughs> later. No, what's, uh, if you say no, the first um, thing that's on your mind. I think something to do with international relations, but with globalization and sort of the development of sustainable education. Development of sustainable something, education. Something to do with that, yeah. And Jörg, what's your next research going to be? What's the next thing you're going to do? Well, right now we are, uh, I'm in a project with the, um, with the uh, uh, Dutch organization that is uh, basically combating uh, infectious diseases, uh, the Rijksinstituut for Volksgezondheit en Milieu, so which is sort of the Dutch equivalent of the CDC. L language is key, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yes. And, um, and uh, we, we are looking basically into um, how do different organizations uh, in the Netherlands, in the public health sector and beyond, react to new viruses uh, if they come here. And uh, we uh, developed two scenarios, um, uh, fictitious but realistic scenarios, um, and uh, asked, uh, did a questionnaire uh, about where do these organizations uh, get their information from, um, what would they need, what would be their role, and we analyzed that sort of as an, uh, as an assessment, uh, what we can improve uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, response to these kind of uh, new threats. New outbreaks, yeah. yeah. So it's just like the movie, Outbreak. Well, good luck, all of you. Thank uh, you very much. Uh, migration, just one example, one, one wicked problem that is being dealt with within the GMSI uh, program. So thank you very much for your insights. Thank you for watching and, uh, well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.